Good morning out there. I am Laolu Akonde. I am a journalist. And this is Inside Sources, a new show here on Channels TV. Inside Sources will be your go-to source for rare and real insider aims, information, insights, exclusive interviews, and in-depth news analysis. I invite you to join me every week here on Channels TV as we unravel the issues and engage the people shaping the trajectory of our nation and the world. With a unique blend of public service experience and a lifelong commitment to journalism, both here in Nigeria and abroad, especially in the United States, I have been on the front line speaking for power and speaking to power. Now, I am thrilled to take you behind the scenes with inside sources, where I'll be your host, delivering the real deal in news, straight from me to you. So, don't miss out on the weekly revelations that will matter to you and to the nation, only on Channels TV. The program will start every week with my take. Here is my take for the week. President Bola Tinubu emphasizes the need for thorough house cleaning in Nigeria's monetary policy. The central bank initiates key monetary reforms, including the unification of the foreign exchange market. The new CBN governor, Mr. Yemi Kadoso, brings zeal and confidence, but the Naira continues to fall against the U.S. dollar. The Naira hits record lows, parallel market at 1,200 Naira to a dollar, while official market remains at 1,000 Naira. The devaluation links to a foreign exchange liquidity crisis, declining external reserves, and dropping foreign exchange earnings. In August, the NNPCL secured a $3 billion loan from the Afriexim Bank, intending to repay it with future crude oil production. The NNPCL states that the loan aims to stabilize the Naira and reduce fuel cost. Recent reports suggest that Afrexim faces challenges in raising their agreed $3 billion loan for the NNPCL. Nigeria's monetary policy landscape remains a complex challenge, requiring reforms and navigating external dependencies. I have three important observations. Number one, Afrexim is now facing challenges raising the $3 billion dollar loan that it had promised NMPC in August. It turns out, according to news report in Empowered Newswire and Reuters, that Afrexim is able to secure only 500 million independently. That means Afrexim on its own can bring out the 500 million. But now for the balance of about $2.5 uh, $2 billion, Afrexim now is seeking to raise the money from other global banks and also from international oil traders. So that's a worry. The second point is the problem around the use of natural resources to back loans. There are concerns regarding this strategy because even uh, Dr. Akiwumi Adishino, the president of the African Development Bank, recently warned against relying on natural resources-based loans. He cited transparency issues, the difficulty of closing the deal and repaying, repaying the debts, and of course, the high cost that is involved. That's the second worry. The third worry is the strategic credibility that has arisen from the fact that Nigeria is engaging a broker instead of a deposit bank. This is what industry watchers at home and abroad have said. And the concern is that this could escalate the risk and significantly increase the cost of dollar importation into Nigeria's foreign exchange markets. Here is the conclusion. As the Naira continues its decline, it's currently about 1,200 Naira in the parallel market and about 1,000 Naira in the official rate. Urgent questions are now being raised. And there are other alternative, more affordable solutions 
to address this forex liquidity crisis. The removal of the oil subsidy has added to the complexity of the problem, making urgent the need for a swift and effective policy measure to elevate the attendant hardship faced by many Nigerians. And so we speak to the policymakers and we ask the president to move in and act quickly because the clock is ticking and there must be a responsible solution that will benefit the average Nigerian citizen. This is a critical problem, but we hope that there will be a timely and positive intervention so that Nigerians can breathe. Inside Sources will be right back with our guest for the interview. Don't go away. Welcome back to Inside Sources. Today I have a distinguished Nigerian on the show, uh, somebody that is respected for his integrity and I dare say his forthrightness. I want to welcome to the program uh, Chief B.C. Akonde, former governor of Osho State. Somebody who has been in politics for very long. You are welcome, sir. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for the program. Well done. Thank you. I'm happy to be in your, in your program. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so let's just get right into it. Uh, so judging from your very long, uh, and I dare say quite impressive uh, uh, public and, and political career, do you think that Nigeria is heading in the right direction? Today, Nigeria has been having a, ton, a stunted growth. Mm. And today, the sources of its nutrition is in deficit. Mm. The nutrition for a good quality are infrastructure, and human capacity. Mm. Both we seem not to have in the right direction. So for that reason, I don't see Nigeria, you know, in the right direction direction to growth. But with the recent attempt to change the situation, let's hope Nigeria will be strong enough to bear the change. Mm. So, so just to take a follow-up on that, uh, two questions on that. Uh, who do we hold responsible for that? And then, is it, um, is it a useful exercise to say that, look, this was the reason why this went wrong, so that we know how to fix it? Uh, it's a long story. Mm. The, the differences in the approach to education you know, had created a sort of a misunderstanding among the leadership and the people of the country. Why some believe in deep education, in universal education. Some believe in different way of looking at it. Why some feel that everybody should be educated. Some feel that it's obviously only if you should be educated. Mm, yeah. And then now we have one Nigeria. We are some are educated universally, some are deeply educated, some are not educated. So we can't understand ourselves. Mm. And uh, we need to look at our education very properly to be able to streamline the, the goal. Uh, clearly, uh, religion and ethnicity play a major role in, in, in our politics. What I want to ask you, sir, is that in your experience, do you think that religion and ethnicity, you know, which is dominant in our politics, do you think that it has served, do you think that political elites have used religion and, and, and ethnicity in the right way? Because yeah. for the most part, these two factors are used as divisive forces. Uh, the two factors are useful elements in community development. It depends on the user. Uh, 
with the right kind of constitution, which we don't have. Mm -hmm. Religion and ethnicity, you know, can complement, you know, the efforts of the community makers. Call them politicians, call them statesmen. Whoever wanted Nigeria to grow forward can use religion and ethnicity, you know, to promote the understanding of the community towards a, a common goal. But the way the constitution is now, uh, we need a true federal constitution. Federal constitution is a very difficult, you know, system of uh, government. But it is a must, it is a must constitution for diversity. Mm. You can't use a unitary government among a diverse, you know, ethnic communities. Mm. As you can, you don't need a federal kind of government as a, you know, a one ethnic nationality. But in a multi ethnic nationality like Nigeria, you need a true federal constitution to make it work well. But because the leaders don't even, you know, want to be educated about what, about what leadership really means. Mm -hmm. Because a leader must understand his people. And you have to be very educated about the, geog about the geography of the placement of your people, mm -hmm. about the history of your people, about the sociological setting of your people, and about the variance in culture. Until you are able to get that, you can be a good leader. Mm. And that's where a federal constitution, a good federal constitution, a true federal constitution, let me put it that way, mm. is what we need to solve the problem of diversity, either in, the, in ethnicity or in religion. But as it is now, we will continue to wallow in confusion. So, 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 um, you, 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 you believe, you believe that we do need a new constitution? Oh, we have no constitution now. Uh, uh, what we have is the understanding of what is our constitution now is that the federal government takes a decision. The rest of us queue behind it. Mm. And that's why you see a, a market woman whose stall has been blown away by the wind. Mm. We'll be saying, ah, added the bo tinumbu. Come and see a flood in our, you know. That's a local government's job. Mm -hmm. As should be directed by the state government. It has nothing to do with the federal government. Mm. Well, you know, but because our people, you know, the constitution is now uh, well defined or simply defined. See how long it is. It is too long. You know, all we need to do is to look at the schedule. And say the federal government is your job, the state government is your job. But the way it is coined and written is too difficult, it's too complicated, you know, for the for the for the Nigerians for the Nigerian people. Yeah. Okay, so so um, let, let let me ask you this uh, follow up question just on on that uh, issue. So so APC had promised, you know, in 2015. One of the things that they said was that there will be restructuring, and I guess this idea of uh, constitution, you know, remaking is part of it. We use, sir, uh, use your voice to encourage that we we do have an opportunity to to really uh, produce the kind of constitution because you have a very uh, strong voice. Sir. Will you use your voice to call for uh, uh, a new constitution for the country, and in line with what APC had promised uh, since 2015, sir? APC made effort. APC set up a set up a committee under the leadership of a, of a, uh, Governor Erufai, and the recommendation was made, and the recommendation could be codified into law, mm. but it remains either for APC or for the APC government or for Nigerian people to look at this document and get themselves educated with it. And then, you know, encourage the National Assembly to turn this, to, to, to turn a new leaf, 
from the recommendation of the APC into a new constitution. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the, the responsibility, I don't know whose responsibility it is, but APC did a promise. APC made an effort, but it's left for our National Assembly, you know, so, to take a cue from that. When we talk about the issue of diversity and our differences, uh, how it is that uh, 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 the, the, the tensions that existed that were exist on issues of religion and ethnicity. But normally, and often, the people of the Southwest, you know, where you hail from, are considered to be uh, a little bit more tolerant. I think it was even uh, former President Buhari that made the point uh, uh, sometimes while he was uh, in his first time that the people of Southwest actually exhibit the, uh, the, the highest form of uh, tolerance in Nigeria. And I want to ask you, you know, as a Yoruba elder also, why is this so? Why is this so? Uh, good foundation in education and at the right time. Southwest started free universal primary education in 1955. And that was about five or six years before independence. Mm. The purpose was that the generality of Nigerians should be thoroughly educated to understand what their responsibility will be when the colonial masters will have left. Mm. But while the Southwest was doing this and doing it well, the East wanted to do it. The East too started in 1957, but didn't have capacity to carry it through and it could last three months thereafter. Mm. But the North never even believed in it at all. And the North was much larger than the East and the West put together. Yeah. So the, the preponderance of the member of the, uh, you know, the citizens of this country mm. never started, you know, universal education. Education means understand. Let me use one thing, for example. Yes, the Yoruba people was not one before 1955. Mm. And the may not understand what I know. If two of them are talking, mm. and then the Gebu man is with them, he might not understand what they are saying. Mm. And this was even as early as 1955. In 1955. If two Egyptians were talking, you know, it may be difficult for Anoyo to understand what they are saying. But with the universal education mm. in 1955, the essence of the primary school education was an education in the mother tongue. Mm. And we all learned common language, common Yoruba. You know, using books written by uh, Chief Osun Odunjo and uh, uh, I have forgotten the other, but you know, Baba Tai Wonki, Tai Wonki, yeah. you know, that kind of, yes, Aba, yeah. Baba, 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 you know, there is what we call the phonic system of learning mm -hmm. and the alphabetical system of learning. And it was introduced into pupils at the primary school, how to learn, you know, from sentence down to letters and how to learn from letter up to sentences. And because of that, within five years, the whole Southwest was speaking one Yoruba. Interesting. So if commonly, by 1955, when the Southwest were started the free universal education, the rest of the country too follows suit. By today, we will have understood ourselves better, yeah. our tolerance, either to education or to differences in ethnicity, will have been the same. Interesting. But because of that early education, I mean, universal education, as early as that time, it is the result of that we are reaping now. It, does, it doesn't limit to tolerance. Even when you look at peace, you look at the uh, security, yeah. you will see that relatively it's better in the Southwest than it is in the East and the North. It's because of this same understanding, you know, common understanding through education, mm -hmm. right. that the security of the Southwest seems to improve better than, than those of the North and the Southeast. 
Yeah, interesting points. And then there's a follow-up that I quickly want to put on that. So do you think that that level of uh, uh, awareness and development of education in Southwest, do you think it confers a moral uh, responsibility on the people of the Southwest to lead? And as particularly now that we have a president who is from the Southwest, do you think this background that you have described confers a moral responsibility on uh, a, a president from the Southwest to ensure that we get it right as a, as a nation this time around? Well, it will, uh, the, the present president will have that push from the background, you know, from which he's coming from. But it depends on the ability of the country to be receptive mm. to the push. Because it's one thing to want to introduce a change, mm. but the ability of the society, the foundation, might be too weak to carry the change unless you can go to the level of the people. Mm. And the level of the people is not universal. The level is undulating. Mm. So what do you think has happened, sir? Oh, uh, <laughs> it has to be rough, mm. but it has to be done. I think the ability of the uh, present government should be able to level up the situation. Sure. But the grand, the foundation is very undulating. It's not uniform at all. Interesting. In, uh, very, very important insight that you are giving, sir. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, let's move along. So, so in in, in two thousand and thirteen, when uh, APC was formed, two thousand and thirteen, and fourteen, uh, there was a lot of expectation. In fact, all the way to the twenty fifteen uh, election that brought in uh, uh, now former President Buhari. Now, do you think that the expectations and the hopes that was raised, you know, by the uh, by the party? has been fulfilled eight years after? Uh, it's not fulfilled because the foundation, which was Nigeria, Nigeria was the foundation upon which APC wanted to create change. Mm. APC did not know that the foundation was that weak. Mm. So to build a strong structure of change on a weak foundation, we're very shaky. Mm. So, it slowed the APC down and it makes it, you know, not so smooth. But now, from the experience of the past, at least of the past eight years, I think APC should be able to, to create a better way of building a stronger foundation, you know, that is making Nigeria resilient mm. to be able to carry the weight of the change that they were advocating they wanted to introduce. Interesting point. Do, do you worry at any point, you know, uh, about, and it's just a follow-up, do you worry at any point that APC and PDP, the two dominant parties, uh, are looking alike? Do you worry about it at all? Or, or do you think that that is not really something to worry about? Honestly, uh, APC and PDP are not alike. They are not alike because they are coming from different backgrounds. PDP was coming from the background of the military mm. incursion into governance. The original leadership of the PDP were the soldiers who didn't want to leave power, but who had to leave power, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the agent of the military, like the contractors, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. who the military were using when they were in power. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, just military inclined minds mm -hmm. from the PDP. Go and look at the history of the PDP. I wrote a book and I, 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 yes. I show you the, the formation of all the political parties yes, exactly. before the advent of the APC. But APC, you know, is coming from the background of the opposition mm. to the inheritors of the military in governance. And the military in governance, you know, is nothing but a bundle of impunity. Mm. The military has no room for the finicky management or manipulation of law and regulations. 
each leader works according to the way his brain works. Mm -hmm. yeah. But a civil administration needs, you know, a collective understanding of what should be done. And that is through constant debate. Mm. Military has no room for debate. It's, you have to obey the last order. Mm. What the master says is what is right. The master might be a fool, but whatever command he gives, you must obey. That's what Fela Anikula Pokuti, you know, refer to as some B. Mm. You know, the military, you know, by their structure. Yes. It's command and control. Yes. It's to fight war, to destroy. Vandals at war. Mm. You face enemy, you demolish enemy. So when you bring them to civil administration, mm. the mentality of vandalism, you know, is the bedrock. Okay. Because they are not trained to govern. Okay. They are trained to fight war. Yes. Yeah. But... The operation of bringing them to govern made them govern like as if they are the war front. Mm. And the master should command and the follower should obey. Mm -hmm. And the master might be an idiot. His command must be obeyed. Mm. So because of that, the culture of the military in governance is nothing, you know, but uh, 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 yeah, you know, mm. yeah. Just do it according to, and that's what we call impunity in power. Mm. The totality of what the military and governance is, is impunity in power. So the PDP came with that background. And they were ruling like that. The APC came with the background of discussion, opposition, mm. examination, reviewing, you know. Yeah. And they say, okay, let us come together and be in power. But when they get to power, the change they want to introduce, you know, into the country, mm. the country itself, which is the foundation of the power, you know, was too weak into, to carry that change. And, you made the point, yeah. and it leads to a reaction. Mm. And the, the reaction is the disorder you are seeing, like uh, ENSA, like student something, like ASU riots, you know, mm. because they have been... For 29 years, they've been used to the rule by impunity. Now you want to bring a change to such a people, they will react. Interesting. So since 2015, of course, this APC has been in power with President um, Wari for eight years. Yeah. You know, uh, a government under which I serve myself. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you as an elder that is there any decision, you know, uh, that was taken by that government that you find, uh, today that we are not really in tune with? From the beginning, I wasn't in tune with the economic manipulation of the Buhari administration. Mm. And I, I I kept saying it, but as part of the administration, I couldn't go to the press to say it. Mm. It, would be all, yeah. it would be senseless. Of course. And uh, Buhari never closed the door of his house to me. Mm. I can meet him when I want to meet him. I can talk to him when I want to talk to him. And I was saying it, that I was not comfortable with the economic management. Uh, with the economic uh, management. Because uh, the, let's, let's use, for example, uh, uh, removal of subsidy. Mm. Between the time Buhari was elected as uh, president mm. and the time he was inaugurated, we had several, you know, discussions and sessions and meetings to say that the subsidy should be removed. Mm. And he was convinced. And I thought as soon as he gets to power, he will remove the subsidy. But uh, I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. After his inauguration, you know, he started uh, being careful, slowing down, mm. you know, trying to, until the first four years. Mm. So at the beginning of his first time, he now came out. He wanted to remove the subsidy. The country reacted. And, you know, you had to back out. Mm. So from beginning, I was not comfortable with the fact that Buhari would, with the subsidy in his hand. The subsidy ought to have been removed in this time. By now, Nigeria would have been used to it. Mm. And it would have been small. That's the only aspect. All the others, Buhari meant well, 
He believes in Nigeria. Mm. And uh, he's so nice about this. Yeah, exactly. About uh, what it meant. But I don't know what what made him, you know, some people, I don't know. I don't, the quality of advice he was receiving mm. might have been, mm. might have been mm. responsible mm. for the way he managed. But, but did, you, did, did you have opportunity to sit down with him and discuss, you know, some of this, your examinations and what, what, what? Oh, many times, time, many times, many times. So what did he say to you? Oh, the country was difficult. The country, you know, like say, oh, we, we need to be careful. We need to be, you know, to be tolerant. We need to, you know, you know, change is very difficult to introduce. Right, true. Right, true. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, now, uh, quite, quite a lot of people, especially from from the southwest, and I think quite quite a, a, a good share of Nigerians have been talking about this question of restructuring. Uh, now, which do you think is the more compelling uh, problem? Is it the need to restructure or the fight against corruption? If you are to choose one, I'm you know just I mean I, if you if you move in the street. Mm. You will see many houses, and people are living in those houses. But the structures are not the same. Mm. It depends on what you mean by restructuring. If your sense of restructuring is purposeless, so the result will be. If you ill define, if you badly define what you want to destructure, so you will find it. First and foremost, we must list, we must define structure. what we mean. What do we want? Uh, you know, it's like drawing a, a, a building plan. You look at a house. Oh, this house was lived in by our Asian parents. And what, where there was no pipe on water, no electricity. Mm. And you want to redesign, you want to restructure that house to allow for you know, uh, water system latrine to allow for, you know, electrical uh, beauty and things. You have to start, you know, by drawing the plan. That's what we call restructuring. Mm. We have to replan and put it into, you know, sort of statute or legal codification. That's, until you do that, you will not be able to get the answer. So if you restructure badly, you will not have solved the problem of corruption. Mm. Until you restructure rightly, you know, base it on good planning and good understanding, you will not have solved any problem. Mm. But, but, so so how, how deep do you think the problem of corruption is in the country? Because I, I, in, a, in, a, in a country where the constitution permits, you know, leadership impunity, mm. definitely, corruption will become a culture. Mm. Interesting. Because uh, adherence to regulation mm. is the opposite of corruption. I see something happening very recently. When I drive on the road and I see, you know, a red light, I thought I should stop, stop. and I will stop. But when I stop, I see other people overtaking me and disobeying that and happens. crossing the line. That and, so, lot, and, uh, I'm wondering, and nothing know? happens. Hmm. In a country where impunity prevails, that's what happens. Some people will be obeying the law. Some people will be disobeying the law. Hmm. So, the leadership has the mentality of the military. And even our uh, new generation governors, they believe they shouldn't look at the regulation or the law before they act. Mm. They act according to their whims, with impunity. And that's why you see disagreement, you see noise, you see acrimony everywhere. So, we need deeper education about the assignment we give to every leader. And it is the leader himself, you know, who volunteer to be a leader, that should try to educate himself about the job he intends to do. Mm. And honestly, they are all written down. Interesting. But most leaders don't even care to read 
when you see green light, you 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 move. Okay. When you see red light and you 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 cross, it means you don't care. Mm. Important, important. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for the insight. Now, so so that takes us to the next question. Yeah. They, they, I, I think in the last three four decades, yeah. you know, uh, if you agree, there has been a decline even in the values that drive us as a people. You know, and you know, this is just what you just um, yeah. mentioned. So, so, yeah. so, so my question is, as a people, you know, uh, made up of government and the government, yeah. how can this be addressed? The decline in values, you know. So, the, for instance, look at what is happening. There's so much focus on everybody just want to get rich now yeah. and get rich quick. Yeah. Uh, somebody is wealthy, people don't <laughs> question uh, the source of it as long as it's worthy and they get a bit of it. You know, culture depends on the education. And education is dynamics. In my days, in my growing up, the value of work, if you don't work, you shall not eat. Mm. Your mother will impress it on you. You must wash these clothes, or you must do that thing, or you must clean this around it. If you don't do it, you won't have your breakfast. So you start working. Everybody believes that hard work is the only thing that can make him successful. Mm. In school, you must work hard, whether as a teacher or as a pupil. But now, the preaching, which is loudest, is that uh, you have to be prosperous by miracle. Mm. If you want to be uh, prosperous, you must believe in some miracles. Mm. In religious houses, in the streets, you know, among ritualists, these people believe in miracles. Cut your mother's tongue and we make money for you. You go and kill your mother, you know, go and bring a spare part or a private yeah. part or body part. Then we will, you know, in the church, oh, miracle is coming. Close your eyes. You know, say it. Everybody. So everybody now believes in prayers without work, waiting for miracles to happen. That's the, the common education now. Mm. The dynamics of our education now is... Don't work hard, but wait for miracle to come to come and make you what you want. Look at that. So definitely, the value will be according to the education available to your, you know, uh, generation. The new generation education never put emphasis on work and hard work, without which you must not eat. It puts emphasis on prosperity by miracles. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of dynamics in the education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we must change the, that dynamics. I, how we get the teachers, I don't know. Whether technology will help us, I don't know. But we must change the, that dynamics in our education. And it, we must go back to the theory of if you don't work, you must not eat. What do you, what, what do you think about the, the political elite now developing what has been described as an elite consensus. That means every political elite, regardless of political uh, partisan differences, agree to a certain uh, uh, stipulated minimums of how to, 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 to operate so that Nigeria can get to that manifest destiny that we all believe for its greatness. Yeah, right. Everything depends on structure. The political elites now don't go to politics because they have a calling for it. They see politics as a trade now. You go and make money, either by fraud or by whatever. You go and buy power. Mm. And you want to pay back from the loony, from whom you borrow money to buy power. Those are the elites of today. When I became governor, from the day, you know, People invited me to come and be governor. Mm. And the day I was uh, inaugurated as governor, if I spent 50000 I mean it too. If I spend 50000 yes, I use it to buy petrol for my car, or I use it to buy Coca-Cola for my friends. Mm. Nobody took one couple from me, and I gave nobody one couple, and I became governor. So I can't be in power now because I have no debt. Mm. I borrow no money from anybody. 
I can't get to power now and start looking for money to pay back. <laughs> so the elite of that caliber is not the same as the elite who came to politics, you know, after they same money and they say, oh, this one billion I'm going to spend to become <laughs> a senator. And he became a senator. He must pay back the one billion. So, you know, the structure of the elite or political elite is not the same. Mm. From my growing up, from my learning, from my kind of politics, yeah. the the political elite mm. of the of this generation is not the same as those of my generation. Therefore, you can't compare orange with an apple. It's not the same at all. Mm. The, 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 the political elites today are traders in politics. So the, the political elites in my days are, you know. Public spirited. Yes, I was trained in finance. In, I was a, an executive of the British uh, Petroleum. When I became a councillor, how did I become? We were admitting with Chief Aulor. You know, we, we read the newspaper, we think we are politicians, and we always say, raise up our mind, <laughs> and we ask questions. And he says, sit down. Okay, if all of you, these boys, all of you, go back and contest the election and become a councillor, if you can win the election and become a councillor, you'll be the one to speak at this meeting. That's at the, at the Committee of Friends, <laughs> 1976. And then I went back home. I was a manager in the British Petroleum. I went back home to become a, a councillor. Wow. So I feel proud that I was a councillor. Today, everybody wants to start either as a senator or as a governor or as a president. Hmm. Nobody, no politician wants to be a councillor now except they, they think that's a small boy's job. Interesting. So, so, so with, your, with your elderly wisdom and your experience, how do you think we, how, how can these things change so that we can get public spirited people to, to, to get into the political arena. Uh, the society itself needs a renewal. And uh, it's a matter for us to research. I won't say I have an answer for it. Mm. Because I was thinking or learning or developing myself for my generation and the immediate generation behind me. Yeah. And I think, you know, all of that all generation will have its own norm. So those who are growing now, yeah. you know, will be able to reform, you know, their own generation and the generation behind them. Interesting. But if to say the military never truncates we our have own it. generation, we will have had the opportunity of handing down the processes mm -hmm. to generation immediately behind us and those coming behind them. And it will have been a culture you know, coming from a historical perspective. Yeah. But because of the 29 years interregnum by military, yeah. the orientation has changed totally. Exactly. So, so are we going to need another 29 years of democratic rule? It may be more, wow. if you are not careful. <laughs> it may be more, if you are not careful. All right. And we pray there will be no military in government again. Amen. Amen. Otherwise, Amen. you won't have an answer for it. Or the end will be collapse. Mm. Interesting. So, so uh, moving along, sir. So, so uh, just some personal takes. I, 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 I know that uh, many people know that the, the former president, President Buhari, has tremendous respect uh, for you, uh, and we also know how uh, you have worked uh, closely, and also have uh, a lot of respect even from the incumbent uh, president. So, so how do you, uh, how, how do you compare the two? You know, both of them have tremendous respect for you uh, because of your integrity, I dare say. How do, you, how do you compare the two of them? I think, I think they have respect for me because of the candor of my advice to them. Hmm. If you give if you give me a contract, I don't know how to execute it. So I won't ask for contract. And I won't ask for, you know, a vapor that is extraordinary. <laughs> so I will say the truth to anybody. You ask me to write it down, I will write it down. You ask me to say it, you know, point blank. I will say it point blank. But I won't just give frivolous advice. Mm -hmm. I will sit down and think very well about what I want to, to, advise on. to, to advise on. And I will, you know, my style is to put it in question for. Look at it. Look at it. Why do you think we cannot do it like that? And if you ask an explanation, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. 
because of I mean, the, the maybe they think about the candor, you know, or the kind of advice I offer them. They respect me for that. But if you ask me to compare the two of them, the two of them believe in one Nigeria. Mm. The two of them believe in change. Mm. One is a village man like me. <laughs> the other one is a city boy. <laughs> <laughs> but the first is a trained soldier. The other one too is an accountant, a finance person like Just me. like you. So there are ways where we agree, there are ways where we disagree. Anytime I want to talk about security or military, Gwari always let me know that that was his constituency and I should be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I have no boundary with the uh, incumbent, incumbent because uh, my attitude about the military seems to the be same, the same about it, this, yeah. about, about the uh, economy too. It, will, it was not difficult for us to agree. Mm. So, the two of them are good men. The two of them meant well for this country. The two of them, you know, need to, I mean, one had ruled us mm. according to the advice available to him. Yeah. The new one now will begin to rule us too according to the ad advice available to, uh, to him. Mm. But the two of them belie believe in the same line of change. Change from bad, from, I mean, from good. Yeah. But don't you, because I do, and I want to confess uh, this, uh, expect President Tinubu to do way better than former President Buhari. Uh, well, he, he, could, he could do better than Buhari for two reasons. One, Buhari was a pioneer, you know, in the, in the change mantra. He was pioneer in the performance for change. Mm. He must have often, you know, like done some cultivation of the land before mm. Tinubu came. Mm. Mm. So whatever may have been the rough one. He has undoed it. So that's the only one that Tinubu will need to, you know, to contend with before moving on. But they believe in the same, you know, mantra for change. For change. Mm. So, so, so do you agree uh, that most people expect that this uh, the, the current president should do way better if he's given time and cooperation. He would do way better. <laughs> better. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So uh, I know that today there are two leaders in the Ferry. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is a fashion party who seems to be the substantive leader, but you know we also have Paddy Banjo who uh, was asked to be in acting capacity. Uh, so so. Uh, I wanted to ask you two questions. Are, are you still a member of Afeni Ferry yourself? And then, uh, how, do you agree that there's a bit of tension between those two leaders of Afeni Ferry? Well, Afeni Ferry, you know, has its own history. And I don't want us to misunderstand the history. And I was with both leaders. Mm. Up to a point. I was one of the people who nominated Fasoranti okay. to be a leader. Okay. But when the likes of Adebanjo was breathing too heavily mm. through the throat of Fasoranti, there was a crisis. Mm. And the younger ones pulled out. They called themselves Afeniferi Inua Group. Oh, yeah. Since that time, I had nothing to do with the older one. <laughs> I became a patron of the Afeni Ferry Renoir. Is that why they call you Baba Moke <laughs> <laughs> I was the patron of the young ones. Of the younger ones. So, since then, I don't know what goes on between the remaining two, the older mm -hmm. two, except what I read in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. So, I don't relate with them. But I'm more comfortable with Baba Fasoretti than with uh, <laughs> Baba Adebanjo. Fasoretti, coming from a background of good education mm. and modest upbringing, 
he tolerates opinion. Mm. Adebanjo is a kind of irritant. He will always say, I ate in the same table with Awolowa and this is what we do there. Without knowing that time are changing and one can change, circumstance can change with time. Mm. So, you know, a rigid kind of uh, uh, ideologue. Uh, is very difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. I'm very, com I'm more comfortable mm -hmm. with the fashionality. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. If there is still any affair, affair anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, um, uh, I know that you're going to be 85. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you, you, you look very fit. We, I mean, we just walked down the stairs uh, together very effortlessly. You know, I just wanted to ask that, uh, how do you manage, you know, to, to be even, I mean, physically fit for sure. And then even mentally alert, you know, what was, what was, what was the trick? Uh, honestly, I cannot explain because I know I feel pains in my joints. I know the age is there because, yes. you know, but I'm managing, it, you know, with the pains, hmm. but coming to think about it. I don't allow anything to give me pressure. I don't keep ill will mm. against anybody. I don't keep bad mind against anybody. I want to be pleasant with everybody. Mm. Old and young, friends and foes, everybody. And I do, I'm not the kind of person who will go to the market and, and want to buy yam and say, First of foremost, are you a Christian or, <laughs> or a Muslim? I will just go straight. How much you sell your yarn? Mm -hmm. And if I have the ability to buy, mm -hmm. I buy. So because I don't go with such kind of rigmarole, mm -hmm. uh, I think I live a happy, you know, inside me, I feel mm -hmm. happy all the time. Interesting. And I, maybe that one is the one keeping me going. Good. And in food, in, in eating, in food, I think, uh, like my doctor advised me, when it remains more for you to, to, to be full, stop. Mm. So when you are feeling, you know, huh? am I not getting full? Don't <laughs> wait to be full. <laughs> to be full. You know, so uh, I think I'm moderate. Yeah. Uh, I try to be moderate in what yeah. I eat. Like, and uh, the way I con comport myself too. You have you have you have, you have been in, in uh, uh, public life and, and politics for a long time, but I don't recollect you ever getting involved in any scandal or, control or serious controversy. How how did you manage to to stay in politics, especially in politics, and be almost uh, virtually scandal free? Uh, scandal is one thing. Uh, uh, I know people describe me as being controversial. I'm not afraid of uh, doing politics. Mm. But I always want my politics to be very selfless. Mm. I shouldn't think about what benefits me. Like uh, when I was governor, mm. I thought I was to hold the office in trust. This office is owned by the people, you know, that elected me. The money that I was put in charge belongs to them. And I must give it to them. I must spend it for them. Mm. And I must spend it as judiciously as possible. An example, I was doing a road by the same contractor mm. in the same area for about 19 million per kilometer. And the federal government is doing its own for 84 million per, per kilometer. You, you yeah. are doing your own for how much? 19. 19, okay. Federal government is doing its own for 84. Huh. That was when you were governor of Oshuste. When I was governor of Oshuste. I got worried in the same Oshuste. Federal government is doing its own between Efe and Elisha. Okay. By the same contractor. I was using the same contractor to do my own, you, you know, know, between, uh, we call the place Konta, to uh, one place in in Shalan. Wow. You know. You were doing 19 million francs, you were doing 84 million. In the same terrain, it worried me. I quickly took a consultant. Please help me look at that job we are doing and give me a report. 
uh, if it's uh, extraordinary, I want to. to mm -hmm. <laughs> and the report given to me was that the road was being badly done. The one on the federal government? Uh -huh. And I kept writing the president, this is your road. It's not being... And I know he was always giving the, my letter to, the, to his minister for works. Mm. But instead of, uh, you know, reacting positively to me, they were hostile to me. Did he respond to your letter? Uh, no, uh, the president will send it to... And that was President Obasanjo? Obasanjo. Uh, but we will send a copy of the... Your, of your letter? Oh, no, he will send a copy of my letter to the minister and send the cover note with which he sent it to, to you. Me. So I know he was passing it on to, to, to his to the, uh, minister. Yeah. But they are doing a bad road. So suddenly a heavy rain came. Mm. Before the heavy rain, Obasanjo called me and said, uh, I should take over the old road between if and Lesha because he want to put a, a toll on the new one. Okay. Ah. And I say, okay. Uh, I thank him. I jokingly said, I may try to may put a toll on mine. <laughs> so he built toll, toll gates. gates where he will be collecting money. A week to the opening of the road, a heavy rain came and washed away the whole 60 kilometers of road. Look at that. Which the federal government built. Look at that. And my own is, is there today like this. My own, no pothole today. Go there. It's over 20 years ago. Hmm. What? Okay. That's one example. Another example. When I was elected, the federal government started the secretariat. They call it federal government secretary. Mm, mm. I think I remember that. A year after I was there, I started, you know, Osho State uh, Secretariat, which they call a very... Mm. In Moshubu now. You know? name Ata, uh, <laughs> so, go there now. Their owners not go to decking level or to roof level. Maybe it's a little beyond window level. Today, wow. almost 30 years. Wow. I started using my own two years after. Wow. Okay. And uh, nobody has a cause. To, rep to do a repair in the building today. So that's selfless leadership. Clearly. And yet, when I left, they said police after me that I stole money. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. You know? So selfless leadership and lack of impunity keeps you away from scandal. Mm. But all other things, we put you inside it. Mm. Mm. Interesting. You know, so I think uh, leadership needs learning. But the practice of it is very, very difficult because it takes a lot of self-discipline. Mm. Self-discipline is the most difficult thing any leader in Kankara. Thank you so very much, Chibiza uh, Kondi, for your time. Uh, for this conversation on the future of Nigeria, uh, thank you for, for your for your forthrightness. Thank you. And, uh, I, I want to wish you uh, in advance a happy 85th uh, birthday. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bert. And that's it uh, uh, on Inside Sources uh, for this week. I'll be back next week with another exciting guest. Thank you very much. My name is Laulu Akonde. Mm -hmm.